Great, thank you. Well, it's very good to be here with you today. Uh, and my talk, if I can get this clicker to work, is about this question. Where are the social reformers? I'm obsessed uh, about social reform. Those of you who've known me a while will say that this is the burning passion, if you like, of my life. But I wasn't always so. In fact, it wasn't until I met this man that I became the obsessive that I have become. And what uh, meeting him uh, did to me effectively changed my life and is the reason ultimately why I'm here with you all. Today, I'm going to try and share with you what I, my take on what a social reformer uh, is in the 21st century and why we need them and where we're going to find them and ultimately how we're going to nurture more of them. But first, let me tell you uh, about how I met this man and what he did to me. I, as I said, didn't start off thinking I would become either uh, involved in social enterprise or in politics or, or any of it. I was very simply minding my own business, working in a consulting firm, McKinsey, flying all over the world and, and helping to develop new ideas in uh, mobile technology and the like. But uh, several things happened to me. First of all, uh, McKinsey were very kind and they gave me a very interesting offer. They said, you can go and off to business school and come back, or you can stay and uh, be try and become a partner, um, or you can do anything you like and we'll still have you after a few years, either via business school or, or, uh, or, or directly, uh, which turned out to be very uh, interesting and useful later on for reasons which will become clear as I speak further. But then another thing happened to me. I met a very interesting person called Brett Rigdorts, who was a fellow colleague of mine in McKinsey. And he was leaving to set up a charity, which we now call Teach First, modeled on a model from America, Teach for America. And it looked very interesting, exciting. And because I had this very interesting offer, it's not anything initially to do with any sense of compassion or desire to serve the world, where I could do something completely risky and off the wall and still be able to you know, come back, a get out of jail free card, I thought, well, actually, the logical thing to do is the riskiest thing. Uh, so I turned down opportunities to work in investing, venture capital, things which many of the people in this room, uh, I'm sure, are engaged in. I decided to try my luck with Brett and spent three years there, three exciting, fascinating years, really for me, about applying what I learned from technology and business and how you scale uh, impact in the business world, uh, following in the footsteps as we did of uh, people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, but applying it to this whole arena of social enterprise, social impact, which 10 years ago was still pretty new and fresh, uh, and to some extent still is today. And I encountered, um, we encountered a degree, a degree of luck, I guess, because within three years, it had gone national um, and uh, had really been a very much a, a high, rapidly scaling uh, initiative, taking top graduates uh, from the best universities and um, asking, inviting them to go and work in some of our toughest schools initially for two years and then afterwards uh, they would either stay on and now there are head teachers and policy makers and leaders in education in Britain or they would go on into other sectors, into banking, into the McKinsey's, the civil service but take that experience of poverty with them uh, into the rest of their lives so they can be uh, more of a reformer. I then left that and uh, did go into venture capital. Uh, didn't enjoy it so much, having had an experience like Teach First. Um, but I did learn one thing from the experience of vetting lots of investment opportunities and uh, only investing in a few, which is the issue in the world, that, to me, doesn't seem to be one of a lack of money at the end of the day. I mean, individual causes need money, that's true. The issue seemed to be one of deal flow. We were seeing so many good opportunities but never being able to quite feel that this was the one that we could give this money to. And the issue of who is going to actually take a step forward and be the entrepreneur and then create something that is worth investing in, that could make a difference, uh, that was the real issue. Deal flow is the issue. So then I spent some time thinking, what am I going to do having been bitten by this socially entrepreneurial bug uh, through Teach First? And where else can I learn about how others have done this? this? This notion that you take something and you scale it rapidly, just like a Facebook or Twitter today. Not just something where you 
spend decades of your life building it up in one small uh, environment, or working for a very large NGO, but something that can be developed from day one. We, we raised about a million dollars for Teach First in its first year and then scaled it nationally uh, very, very quickly uh, and very, very deliberately. Well, my journey took me all the way back to this man. This is the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury. He was a Victorian reformer. And uh, he was really one of many reformers in the uh, social, uh, in the Victorian era, who had just experienced an industrial revolution, encountered huge amounts of social and other problems, environmental problems, and decided, really very much the elite, decided to apply all of their skills, knowledge, and wealth to tackling these problems, often for the first time. And they were the ones that created chains of schools, uh, temperance movements, abolished slavery. Shaftesbury himself was incredibly prolific. He not only um, helped to reduce factory hours for, uh, for children, he helped to abolish uh, chimney sweeping. He then helped to invent shoe shining so the kids who weren't chimney sweeping suddenly had something to do. He helped to develop ships where they provide vocational training for teenagers to then send them to New World to, uh, with the skills of a carpenter or a plumber. Uh, many, many different things, 60 different ventures in his life, many of which scaled nationally or internationally. And so really, I've spent the most of my last sort of uh, seven, eight years trying to follow in his footsteps. But combining that spirit, that Victorian reformist spirit, with the technology that we now have at our disposal in the 21st century, and also some of the skills that we have from business. Because actually, the, there is a difference between what, what they were doing to some extent in that era and what we have to do now, certainly in developed countries. Many of the social problems we encounter are complex. Think about obesity, low aspirations in schools, uh, you know, global problems around immigration. These are not just about creating a, a school or building or providing drugs or changing the law. They require a much more deep, complex interaction with problems that require a certain scale and a certain approach to systemic change which uh, is you know, increasingly needed more than ever. We're finding, actually, that the legislative route and the, the money route isn't always the way to solve problems. So we need social reformers for the 21st century. Question is, where are we going to find them? And how are they going to be different from just purely more social entrepreneurs or more social financiers, impact investors, venture, lab, venture philanthropists, or indeed people who've pledged to donate, good as all those things are? We need social reformers to bring together what I call the elements that create the anatomy of a modern day social venture. Basically, the ideal process, and this is something that we've learned through the years, uh, developing you know, charities like the Challenge Network, uh, uh, social enterprises that work in ex-offending, and many, many other, others that I've been involved with, really to go from the idea to then think about what kind of people should drive forward this idea and then think about the money, whether it's philanthropy or investment, that is needed to power this idea, and then finally to execute that idea, to come up with our solution. And many of the, the challenges today don't have solutions that right now are scalable to tackle them, tackle them. And I fear sometimes, because of the abundance, certainly of money, and after the last 10 years, the abundance of people who want to be social entrepreneurs, that we don't always go about this kind of work the right way. The challenge we have, if we have too much money and uh, an abundance of people who want to be social entrepreneurs, is we don't often necessarily focus on, well, what is going to solve the problem? What is going to solve obesity? What is going to address the issue of long-term chronic unemployment, intergenerational poverty, and so on and so forth? And so design is very important. And there's a whole ecosystem that now needs developed, developing, just as there was a whole community of social reformers in the Victorian era which I'm very passionate about developing, social venture intermediaries, specific specialists in designing and coming up with those scalable ideas, social talent intermediaries, finding people who've got the right skills, not just people who have a passion to change the world, but pe teams who have all the kind of technical and uh, sectoral expertise and all the right governance to come up with ventures that work, and then think about the money, whether that money needs to be in, of, of an investment kind or, or a grant kind. We need social reformers who are adept at bring, combining the ideas, the people, and the money to create what I call scalable deal flow. If we don't, there's a danger that we create inflation. There's so much money chasing so few scalable opportunities 
that suddenly we create a whole industry where people can frankly just live off the donations rather than actually get, get on with solving the problems uh, that are out there. Now, in the Victorian age, there were three sources of social reformers. Uh, there were people who had life, life events that were life-threatening. They got sick. So think about Spedden Lewis, the son of John Lewis, who spent a year in hospital after a, an accident, which then led him to develop the, the John Lewis model. Uh, people who were first-generation wealthy tycoons, but who uh, suddenly discovered that they wanted to have a, a greater purpose. And often it was, again, the second generation who took that forward. And then people of faith. Think about the Quakers. Think about um, you know, many of the evangelicals who were there in the uh, Victorian era. Sometimes all three coincided. And I think the hunt is on now, today, for social reformers for the 21st century, perhaps who've had similar experiences that have led them to come to this conclusion, who have the skill, the ability, and the insight to tackle uh, complex social uh, problems. Because 21st century reform, I posit, we've just been speaking, hearing about health, is about much more than just philanthropy, in my view, which is you know, the business of impact, or about social entrepreneurship, which at its heart is a, is a conversation about sustainability. To me, social reform is more like modern medicine, but in a different way. Society, increasingly Western society, with all of its complex problems, I find is like a, is like a human body with various conditions, various diseases, various viruses increasingly that affect it. And most of the solutions that we've come, we've come up with over the last few centuries don't work anymore. They're like antibiotics. We build schools or we put more money, we spend billions on various programs or we try to change laws and somehow we find that we're getting diminishing returns because the nature of the problems, as I say, are different today. They're not just to do with a lack of resources or people not following the rules. They're to do with human behavior and attitudes, particularly to risk. And if you think about it, and I th I've thought about it, most of the reform, most of the, the initiatives that I've developed over the last few years have been about tackling risk. The only reason why I left business and got into what I was going into was somebody gave me a low-risk card to step out of one career and embark into the unknown. Teach first. How do you convince top graduates in the best schools to go to deprived schools? Or you find the very best brands that will guarantee them you know, the same kind of opportunities to go into banking or other sectors because they were worried that uh, teaching was, was just a, a one-way street. It's all about tackling risk, and I can talk about this about, more about this perhaps later when we get to the panel session. But ultimately, just as in health, we need to develop a whole infrastructure for social reformers. In health, we have teaching hospitals, we have consultants, we have randomized controlled studies. Whereas right now, sadly, in philanthropy, in a lot of work that we do, it still feels to me sometimes like we're going back 500 years. We're using leeches, we're using SROI, or we're using you know, all kinds of methods, and we have a whole industry but really we need to get more scientific. So that's why uh, I'm developing with others a new center for social reform and innovation designed to try and identify people from different walks of life who want to go down this journey, either staying within their bank. Imagine if many of our banks saw themselves as social reformers. In fact, the Quakers did. Uh, many of our banks actually would, came from that source um, and who are trained to think about the science of how we measure impact, how we develop scalable initiatives, and how we ultimately predict uh, which is gonna, what things are going to work and what things aren't going to work with a huge amount of rigor. So many years ago, we experienced a world in which medicine was very basic. We cut off limbs. We tried all kinds of treatments. Today, we need something with more rigor, with more science, and practitioners, particularly with the right kind of ethics. And unless we raise up better trained social reformers for the 21st century, I believe that there is a danger that will produce a generation of, say, social bankers with unspent funds, or social entrepreneurs with ventures that cannot scale, and social measurement tools that make us feel good, but maybe don't measure the key drivers of change. But if we do find more of these social reformers, I believe the benefits to humanity will be immense. Thank you. Matt. 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 Do you think there's a tension between your account, which calls for system scale innovation and change, and the way that charities tend to speak to uh, single types of intervention, 
Freud talked about the narcissism of small differences, that charities are always trying to argue that their particular specific intervention is different rather than thinking in this systemic way. Yeah, I think so. I think sadly, um, these days, uh, a lot of behavior in our sector follows money. And money is often siloed and, and tied to very specific um, areas. Even you know, in health, it's a classic example. You can compare your charity with other charities and so on. And I think when a field is mature, you know, when a market, if you like, is mature, just as in financial services, you can do that. It becomes more commoditized, if you like. But many of the problems that we face are in new, completely new areas where you need interdisciplinary approaches that cross different sectors and boundaries. I mean, national service was a classic example. Everybody thought we were developing a, a youth program, but actually, uh, which with personal development, and there's a whole you know, set of players that do that. But actually, the really innovative thing about that, that initiative was we brought together in teams of 12, very rich kids with very, very poor kids from low-income backgrounds, from academies and inner city schools with private schools. And they spent all this time together thinking they were doing youth development, which they were, but actually the real benefits of society is we were breaking down social barriers, cutting across, you know, and they're friends for life. And that's what national service did when you fought in the war, officers and, and privates, and afterwards all the economic and social benefits that came of that. Now that kind of model is very hard to design in a world in which we all only follow, you know, this or that target. Thank you very much.